We're in Revelation chapter 4. Our theme is the throne of God. We're going to go right up to heaven and take a look at it. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And tonight I'm going to give you another one of my reasons why I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. And uh, I'm going to say a lot of things that will indicate my belief in the pre-tribulational rapture, but I'm going to give you a proof tonight of the pre-tribulational rapture. I think probably the rapture is pictured right in verse 1 when God said, come up here. But uh, I'm not going to push that point. That's not the proof. <laughs> Chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty thrones. And upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts or living ones or living creatures full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face like a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him uh, that is seated or sits on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sits on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. Is that good or what? Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power for thou hast created hast all things created for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are created, for thou art worthy, O Lord. How many of you heard that for the first time or sang it for the first time? Many of you. One more time. It's just verse 11, so <laughs> follow along. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, 
hast all things created, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created, for thou art worthy, O Lord. Isn't enough to just read this, you know, you got to participate. <laughs> got to get used to what you're going to do in glory. The throne of God. Matthew 19, 28 says that the Messiah will sit on the throne of of his glory. The twelve apostles, we're told, will sit on twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Isaiah 9, 7 says that the Messiah will sit on the throne of David. Uh, in Luke 1, 32, it says that our Savior will sit on the throne of his father David and it will be given to him by the Lord God. In Hebrews 4.16, it tells us that we are to come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But Revelation 20, verse 12, speaks of a great white throne before which all unbelievers will be judged. The word throne appears 58 times in the New Testament, 43 of them in Revelation, and 14 of the 43 in chapter 4. I would say that Revelation is the throne book of the Bible, and chapter 4 is the throne chapter of the Bible. 14 times it mentions throne. Now, I want to share with you tonight seven things about this throne in heaven, the throne of God. And the first thing I want you to see is the place where the throne is located. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Then in verse 2, a throne was set in heaven. In Psalm 11:4, it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. In Psalm 103, 19, it says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, plural, and his kingdom ruleth over all. The throne is set in heaven. Now that's a heaven where God dwells. We sang, enter into the dwelling place of the Lord most high. That's what we're doing. We're entering the dwelling place of the Lord Most High, and the central feature of heaven is that there is a throne set in heaven. The first thing John sees is the throne. It is not the 24 elders. It is not the lamps of fire. It is not all the angels. It is not the heavenly city that's being prepared that will come out of heaven. The first thing he sees is the throne of God. And that ought to tell us a great deal about our relationship to our God. There's a number of things, in fact, about six of them, that I want to share with you about the place where that throne is located, heaven. First of all, notice the sequence of events here. It says in verse 1, after this. And then at the end of the verse, it says, I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. The first phrase and the last phrase are exactly the same in Greek, after these things. Now turn back to chapter 1, verse 19. In chapter 1, verse 19, we had an outline of the book of Revelation. It said, write the things which thou hast seen. That would be the resurrected Christ, recorded in verses 12 and following. Then write the things which are, the Bible says the things which are, are the seven churches of Revelation. And then the things which shall be hereafter, or after these things. The end of verse 19 is the exact same phrase as chapter 4, verse 1, which tells every student of Revelation that the outline is chapter 1, vision of Christ, the things which thou hast seen. Chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches, the things which are, that exist in John's day. And third, the things that will be after these things. 
So from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the book is after uh, the history and the uh, messages to the churches. So right away, I have a sensitivity to the fact that the rapture of the church could very well be occurring at this moment. Because it's after these things that all the future is mapped out, which includes the tribulation. After what things? After the things which are, which are the seven churches. So the church age exists, chapter 2 and 3, and then after this, we have the future and the tribulation. By implication, indirectly, we have a statement dealing with the rapture of the church. The sequence of events is very important. Number two, look at the seeing of these events. John says, I looked. Very important. I know it seems incidental just looking at it. Pardon the pun. But the Greek word is used 70 times in the book of Revelation. And each time it indicates that John is actually seeing these things. Now if I asked you, do you believe that John literally was taken to heaven? What would you say? A lot of people believe, well, it's just a vision. No, John says he was there. John says he saw it. I have a tendency to believe that he was there and he saw it. You say, well, how did God do that? I don't know. I have no idea. I do know that verse 1 demands that he was there. It says, I will show thee. Turn over to chapter 21, verse 10, and you'll see the exact same phrase. I will show thee. In chapter 21, verse 10, we have the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And uh, John was in the spirit back in chapter 4, and here it says the same thing. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. I will show thee, and John just adds a footnote at the end of the book, and he showed me. The Lord is showing John. The angel who's communicating the message is having John look at all of these things. He records that he saw and he heard. Back to Revelation 4. Third, look at the words about the sound that he heard. He said, the first voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. Go back to chapter 1, verse 10. In chapter 1, verse 10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now I almost, you know, I love visual aids, object lessons, and I've been kind of cool and reserved up here for quite a while, and I, I am thinking about the object lessons that I want to bring in the book of Revelation, but one of them I thought about bringing tonight, but I thought, well, the shock would be too much. <laughs> but I thought about bringing a trumpet and going down the aisle and playing it in your ear just blowing it as loud as I could, so that you would enter in to the dwelling place of the Lord Most High. Everybody with me? Now John says, I heard. You know, 23 times, he says in Revelation, 23 times, I heard. 70 times, he says he saw something. I looked, or I beheld, or I saw. Interesting. John wants us to know it really happened. He saw these things. And he heard these things. There were loud sounds. He didn't say, um, I thought I did, or it seemed like something, or I don't know whether I was sleeping or not. He didn't say that at all. He said, I heard it, and the sound, I'll tell you what it was like, is like a trumpet blowing in your ear. That's how loud it was. Now, I've told you before that you need to get used to loud music. There's a lot of people who struggle with this, I know. The word loud appears 84 times in the book of Revelation. <laughs> Heaven is going to be loud. A lot of you say, well, I'm not going there. <laughs> Believe me, you won't like the alternative. <laughs> you say, well, my ears can't stand loud music now. Well, God's going to revolutionize your ears. He's going to give you brand new ones, and you're going to be able to hear it. God likes things loud. You ever been in church and somebody say to you while you're singing out so loud because you're off key, shh, that didn't come from the Lord. The Lord likes it loud. Just let it rip. You say, well, he can't sing. God said, make a joyful what? Not a single musician said that. 
But God said, make a joyful noise, make a joyful shout. God likes things loud. He likes them loud. And John says, I heard this, and it was loud. He even uses adjectives to describe the sounds. What I'm trying to say is that I believe that John literally was there. You say, well, how did it happen? I told you I don't know for sure. The fourth thing I want you to see is the symbolism that's implied here. In verse 1, it says, come up here. Come up here. Now, John, like us, is a member of the church age. And in amazing symbolism, he is caught up. Now, all the words suggest he literally goes up to the dwelling place of the Most High. He is in the third heaven, the place where the throne of God is. He's there. Can you imagine living 1,900 years ago, first century apostle, and can you imagine being taken to glory and actually see it? You remember when Paul was caught up to the third heaven? 2 Corinthians 12. He said, I saw things that it's impossible to even express. Why, these are things that are so wonderful. The abundance of the revelations were so fantastic. God gave me a thorn in the flesh just to humble me and, and keep me straight because I'll tell you, what I saw is unbelievable. He didn't care what happened to him anymore. I've been there. I've seen it. Martin Luther King said, I've been to the mountain. Oh, hey, brother, wait till you get to glory. The mountain will look terrible. We're talking going to heaven and seeing the throne of God open in heaven. Come up here. I believe that picture is the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says it will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It says a door was opened in heaven, inviting John to come up. A door is open. Go back to chapter 3, verse 8. In the message... To the church at Philadelphia, it says, Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. The door was opened in heaven. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door. That's the door of your heart. And you're to open that. So if you open the door of your heart to the Lord, he's going to open the door of heaven itself for you to come through. Isn't that neat? A door was opened in heaven. Now back to... Revelation 4 again. And I want you to see the spirit in which John found himself. And here is our clue as to how this happened. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the spirit. Go back to chapter 1, verse 10. He said, immediately I was in the spirit. Now when I see the definite article, the, in front of spirit, I usually think Holy Spirit. When I see our English translators put a capital S on spirit, I suppose I'm to conclude that it's the Holy Spirit, but I don't think so. First of all, the definite article is not in the Greek text at all. It's just, I was in spirit. And normally that's contrasted with in flesh. For instance, in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now what he was contrasting was the external worship of the religious uh, practices of the Samaritans. He was at the well talking to the Samaritan woman who said, well, we, we worship on this mountain. But Jesus was contrasting her outward observances with the true worship that's in our spirit or inside of us. Spirit in contrast to the flesh. Inward in contrast to the outer man. Now in chapter 1, verse 10, John said, I was in, and my English again says the spirit, but there's no the in the Greek text. I was in spirit. On the Lord's day, or the day of the Lord. That time that God spoke about by the ancient Hebrew prophets, the day of the Lord, the tribulation period. He said, I was in spirit at that day. God literally transferred him to that day. So it is a matter of timing, is it not? Now, I, I want you to understand, I don't understand this. I really don't, and I want to make sure that's very clear. And I've studied it a great deal, but I do not understand it. But I want you to know I really believe it. I believe John was there. I believe he saw these things. He heard these things. He was literally in the throne room of heaven itself in front of the throne of God the Father. Can you believe it? I was in spirit is a matter of timing because according to chapter 1, verse 10, I was in spirit at the day of the Lord. Well, I believe the day of the Lord is initiated in chapter 4, verse 1. Come up here and I'll show you things that will take place after this dealing with the day of the Lord. And he was in spirit again. 
But it not only involves timing, it involves place or location. Let me give you an example. Turn to chapter 17, verse 3. In chapter 17, we have this uh, remarkable vision of the woman who sits on the seven-headed beast. And in chapter 17, verse 3, we read this. So he carried me away in, and once again they put the definite article the there, but it's not in the Greek text. He carried me away in spirit into the wilderness. So three times in the book we have this statement. Chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the spirit on the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. Chapter 4, verse 2, I was in the Spirit, and a throne was set in heaven. Chapter 17, verse 3, he carried me away in spirit to a place in the wilderness. It involves timing, and it involves location. Somehow, God, by spiritual transference, maybe a spiritual time machine, I don't know, but God literally transferred John from the first century into a time that's still future from our day now. He was there, he saw it, he says it 70 times that he saw it, he said it 23 times that he heard the sounds of it. He was there, folks. And it's a remarkable, remarkable uh, fact indeed in this book. Uh, back, please, again to chapter 4 of Revelation. The, the, the sixth thing I want you to see is the sea of glass that was before the throne. As we examine the throne of God, the place where the throne is in heaven, there's a sea of glass. It says that down in verse 6. It says, before the throne, in front of the throne, there's a sea of glass like crystal. Now turn to Revelation 15. Revelation 15, and look at verse 2. In the scene that describes um, the final seven last plagues, it's a scene that's in heaven. And the temple of God is opened in heaven. In chapter 15, verse 2, it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass, same words, mingled with fire here. Obviously, the judgments are coming. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, these are the martyrs of the tribulation, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. They're standing on this sea of glass that's in front of the throne of God. Now, many of us um, examining that are reminded that in ancient history, almost every monarch and king had a beautiful pavement, sometimes made out of marble, um, different precious stones were used, a pavement between himself and his subjects. And he, uh, a subject could not come onto that pavement without uh, the scepter being extended or the king inviting that person to come. Apparently, God also has some sort of barrier like that to remind us of his holiness. No, I'm not making it up. Turn to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. So the scene in heaven of the throne of God, what we're going to see one day, there's a beautiful sea of glass. It's like crystal. Uh, later in Revelation, it speaks of crystals being clear. You can see right through it. And you can imagine with the light of God himself and his own presence shining through that, Lord only knows how thick it might be, the beautiful sight, dazzling sight that it must be. This whole sea of glass like a pavement in front of the throne. Well, look at what it says in Exodus 24, verse 10. When Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel were involved. It says, they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. Interesting. So many people believe that's being referred to also in Revelation and reminded us that God has around him, in a visible demonstration to all of us, a beautiful pavement or sea of glass to demonstrate the holiness and the purity of God. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I have a feeling it'll be so dazzling that we will understand holiness then much more than we do now. Do you remember at Mount Sinai, God drew a circle around that mount and the children of Israel and their animals were not allowed to cross over the line or they'd be killed instantaneously by God. God once again putting boundaries and limitations around 
uh, his presence and indicating to God's people that he is a holy God. He is separate from sin. It's an amazing sight. Back to chapter 4. We looked at the place where the throne is located. Let's look at the person who sat on the throne. Verse 2 and 3. This is God the Father. This is not Jesus. Jesus will come up in chapter 5. This is God the Father. And I'm told in verse uh, 3 that he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there's a rainbow around about the throne in sight like an emerald. Now, I see at least four things about the character and attributes of God here, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. This is one of those fine points of Scripture that can bless your socks off if you just take the time to study it. Number one, I believe we have presented here the holiness of God. I mentioned that before. When it says he's like a jasper. Now, we're looking at him now, not the sea of crystal around the throne. We're looking right at God. Many people believe the jasper is a diamond. The word used here is for a diamond. We do know that in Revelation 21, 11, it says of the holy, heavenly, new Jerusalem city, that her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Many uh, gemologists who have studied that said that, that's got to be a diamond. If it is, it's an interesting thing because... When light goes through the diamond, as you know, it's a spectrum, and the multiplicity of colors that would shoot out. And remember, God is light, and the brilliance of God's light was even seen on the Mount of Transfiguration, the case of Jesus, when for a moment of time, he was transfigured before his disciples, and they were blinded by the dazzling sight of God's holiness and his presence as light rays shot out from the body of the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? When we see God the Father on the throne, and he is like a jasper, a light, a stone most precious, clear as crystal, a diamond. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It's a moral truth, but it's also a literal truth. When God said, let there be light, and there was light, he didn't need to call the Edison Company. <laughs> in the future, we don't need any lights, because the Lord God and the Lamb are the light of eternity. So evidently God himself has penetrated the entire uh, solar system of solar systems with himself. God said, let there be light, and there was light, because God just allowed himself to be seen. Is God only light? No. But out of his presence comes the brilliance of light. And if it is a jasper and a diamond, it's going to be like a spectrum. A multiplicity of colors are going to shoot out in all directions from uh, the effulgent rays of the holiness of God Almighty. I, I tell you, words are inadequate to describe this, that's for sure. Not only his holiness, but I see his justice here. It says in verse 3, he was like a jasper and a sardine, or a sardius stone. Now, a sardius stone is like our blood red ruby. And it's referring to a blood red appearance that is not red, meaning shiny and bright red. We're talking about a dark red like blood. And that was true throughout all of ancient history. The Sardin stone is a blood-looking stone. That's interesting because look over at Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. When the seals are opened and the horsemen of the apocalypse come forth, it says there went out another horse that was what? Red. It's literally blood red. Power was given him to set on it to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another, and it was given unto him a great sword. Just an illustration to tell you that the blood red appearance of the stone is really judgment. What we have here pictured is an appropriate picture of God because we're entering the tribulation period when God is going to unveil his wrath and vengeance against this world. So we see his holiness and we see his justice also being pictured. But interestingly, I see his love here. You say, well, where, where'd you find that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Turn to Exodus chapter 28. Now this is a blessing. <laughs> I love this. Exodus 28. God's word is so precious. There's so many nuggets of truth to be found if we will just search it. Exodus chapter 28. 
I see not only God's holiness and justice, but I see his love. In Exodus 28, 17 to 21, we have the description of the breastplate of the high priest. It says, chapter 28, verse 17 to 21. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a, what? Sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be an emerald, sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a what? Jasper. Some believe that the word diamond in verse 18 is incorrect, and Jasper should be the diamond. I'm not going to fight over it. I simply am going to say that the Sardis and Jasper are the first and twelfth stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel on the breastplate of the high priest. Is everybody still with me? Hebrews 3.1 says that our Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest. And on the breastplate are all the people of God. And those stones each represent the tribes. Now, if you're Jewish, you're already way ahead of me because you know what the order is. But I want to remind you of what the order is. You know, the Bible says that we are accepted as believers in the beloved one. I believe that these jewels indicate that God's people are precious to him. The Bible calls us jewels. We're delights to the heart of God. We are treasures to God. We are precious in his sight. The Bible tells us about that. Well, the first stone, the Sardius stone, represented Reuben, the firstborn son. Reuben's name means in Hebrew, behold a son. The last stone was the Jasper, and it represented, of course, the last tribe, which is Benjamin. And Benjamin in Hebrew is the son of my right hand. Now watch this carefully. On that breastplate, in the order of it, he's like a jasper and a sardine stone. You have, in reality, the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Reuben, behold, a son, is the incarnation of Christ. Benjamin, the son of my right hand, he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, is referring to the exaltation of Jesus Christ, our beloved one. So on that breastplate, in the tribes of Israel, you have, in fact, a testimony to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I are accepted in the beloved one who is our high priest. Behold a son! And Isaiah 9 said, A child is born and a son is given. The incarnation, he came into this world to die for our sins. But when he died, he was exalted to the right hand of God and purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His exaltation also, for the whole plan of salvation is seen on the breastplate of the high priest who alone intercedes for us. As the high priest alone went into the holy of holies, and the Bible says, by a new and living way, which he consecrated by his own flesh, we now can go directly into the throne room of God and talk to him personally and directly. And we don't have to go through anyone else because he has paved the way. Is that great or what? The Lord Jesus is our high priest. The Lord Jesus is the son who was born the Lord Jesus is the Son who is exalted at the right hand of God. And the Lord Jesus is the one who takes you into the Holy of Holies by his own blood. Is that great or what? He ever lives to make intercession for us. And through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to the Father. What a blessed. You see, I see his love there. I am accepted in the beloved one. As I look at he who sits on the throne, I see his holiness, yes, and I see his justice. But also in the middle of the holiness and justice, the sardine and jasper stone, I see the love of God for his people. I also see his faithfulness, a fourth attribute 
of the person who sits in the throne. Because the text says, if you go back to Revelation chapter 4 again, it says that there's an emerald, a rainbow around the throne in sight like an emerald. What a beautiful scene that is. And I remind you that the rainbow that's around the throne of God, why would God put a rainbow around there? Because as we know, God said in Genesis 9, 13, after the flood, he said to Noah, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Now God destroyed the world with a flood and then gives him a rainbow as a sign of his faithfulness. How's he going to destroy it the next time since he said he'd never destroy it with a flood again? By fire. You understand when the sea of glass shows up in chapter 15 with all the believers standing on it who've been redeemed, we see it mingled with fire. Very interesting. Turn to Psalm 89. The rainbow is definitely a picture and a sign of the faithfulness of God. I don't make that up. The Bible says so. Psalm 89. So pictured in heaven, the place where that throne was set, the person sitting on the throne, we see his holiness, his justice, his love, and his faithfulness. What a wonderful, wonderful Lord we have. Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy what? Faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. That's the rainbow. Let's keep going and we'll see even stronger. Verse 5 again. The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation. Say, There's something in the heavens that praises the faithfulness of God. Uh, verse 8. I love this one. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee. It surrounds God, his faithfulness. He's a faithful God. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us. Uh, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. The faithfulness of God is essential to everything. Think about this. There are wicked and perverse people in this world out to destroy us, induced by Satan and his demonic world. Yet God says in 2 Thessalonians 3, the Lord is faithful who will establish you and keep you from the evil one. Everything's based on the faithfulness of God. You can count on him. He will never fail. Jesus never fails. I read in verse 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. You may fail. Others will fail you. God will never fail. Look, please, at verse 37. It shall be established forever like the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. That's the rainbow, folks. Every Jew knows it. In the heavens, God put a testimony to his faithfulness. There has never been a destruction of the world by a flood since the days of Genesis. God is faithful. And when I see the throne of God, I'm reminded that God is a holy God. He says, be holy for I am holy. God is a just God. And though I sometimes say, how long, Lord, are the wicked going to prosper and the righteous suffer? Well, the tribulation will answer it. And I see the love of God. I'm one of those jewels. And it's through him, my high priest, the son who was born, the son who was exalted, that I have access into the presence of God. I'm accepted in the beloved one. And I have a faithful God who will never leave me nor forsake me. And as 2 Timothy 2.13 so beautifully says, if we deny him, what a statement. Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. How interesting. It's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we have a sure anchor of the soul, says Hebrews 6. Six. You can count on the promises of God. They are yes and yes. And they are amen. Reliable, totally faithful, 
you can count on him who sits on the throne. And by the way, he's not given anybody else a chance to be on that throne. He is the one who is there forever and ever, the Bible says. No one else. There's no room. There's no vacancies in the Trinity, in case you wondered. <laughs> God's not going to share it with anybody. Back to Revelation 4. I told you I had proof of the pre-tribulational rapture. Remember that? You've been looking for it, haven't you? It brings us to the third point. The people who sit on thrones around the throne. Now you're in the throne room of heaven. You're John. You walk in, the first thing you see is that throne and the one who sits on the throne. Now you're going to be seeing the people who sit on thrones all around the thrones. Chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty thrones, and upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. Now who are these people that are sitting around the throne on thrones. 24 of them, to be exact. Well, let's kind of break this down a little bit, okay, just for fun. First, whether you are a post-tribulationist or a pre-tribulationist or a mid-tribulationist or simply an ah-tribulationist, you don't believe in it at all, <laughs> would you agree that whoever these people are, they are called elders? Amen? Now, I don't want you to make a mistake here. Look at verse 4 again. On the thrones I saw four and twenty what? They're called elders. Now, right away, that eliminates three things, three groups. Number one, they cannot be tribulation believers. Why? Turn to chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. There are 24 elders in heaven around the throne. They cannot be tribulation believers. He's not, John's not seeing those who are going to get saved in the tribulation who are going to be martyred and then resurrected, and now they're up there on the throne. John's not seeing that. First of all, they haven't even got saved yet, and he already sees the 24 elders up there. But even stronger, chapter 7, verse 13, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, who are these who are arrayed in white robes, and from where do they come? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, These are they who came out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Obviously, the tribulation believers are not the elders, because the elder doesn't even know who they are. Who are these who come out? There's someone other than themselves. Now go back to Revelation 4. Now you may not know the significance of what I'm saying, but most post-tribs do. They know right away where I'm headed. Because this is a proof of pre-tribulational rapture. They are elders. They cannot be tribulation believers. Well, the number one belief of all post-tribulationists is that they are angels. Sorry, they can't be angels either. You say, why? Go back to chapter 7 again. He said, oh, I was just there. Why'd you have me turn back? <laughs> it's because I forgot that we were going back there. <laughs> chapter 7, verse 11, okay? Now, they can't be angels. But that's the number one view of all post-tribulationists, that they're angels. That's what they are. Verse 11, and all the angels. Would you say that means all of them? Okay. All the angels stood around the throne and... Whoops. Maybe I didn't read that right. Half of the angels stood around and the elders who were also the other half of angels. Is that what it says? No. It says, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. Now back to Revelation 4. Now, if they're not tribulation believers, they're not angels, ah, here's another possibility if you're a post-trib. I bet it is Israel. It's Israel. Must be Israel. Oh, you know, it's got to be Israel. I'll tell you why. Because the number 24 only appears one other time in the entire Bible. 2 Chronicles 24 and 25. In that two-chapter section, it deals with the 24 divisions of priests of the nation of Israel. And we know that the 24 is a number representing a larger body. Because there are 24 divisions. The priests are representatives of the people before God. So the whole nation of Israel is represented by the 24 elders. But it is interesting it didn't call them 24 priests. It called them 24 elders. It didn't say 24 divisions of priests. But I will grant this, 
the number 24, if it's going to be interpreted by Scripture, then can only be interpreted by the usage of 24, which is only in 2 Chronicles 24 and 25, describing 24 divisions of priests that represent the whole nation of Israel. But it can't be Israel. Why? Because we still have Israel in the tribulation period. We've got 144,000 of them in chapter uh, 7, and we have a great remnant of them, that one-third of all the Israelis living at the end of the tribulation, who will turn to the Lord, for he will pour out his Spirit on the house of, of Israel and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of David, according to Zechariah 12.10. So we have Israel also being persecuted in the last half of the tribulation in chapter 12. So all of Israel is not in heaven at the beginning of the tribulation. So it cannot refer to the completed nation of Israel. Well, who are they? Well, let's keep going. You still in Revelation 4? Verse 4. Now, it does say that they sit on thrones. Amen? Will you give me that? Look at chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 21. The messages to the seven churches. This one, the church at Laodicea. Each one of them has a promise to the overcomer. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Throne sitters, how about that? Now go back again to chapter 4. Look at this again. I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. How do you believe that 24 elders are clothed in white raiment? That's what it says. Now go back to Revelation 3, verse 5. Another promise to the overcomer. This one, the church at Sardis. It says, he that overcometh, the same shall be what? Clothed in right, white raiment. Imagine that. A promise to church age believers that they'll sit on thrones and be clothed in white raiment. Now, is this a coincidence? Maybe two shots is a Well, I don't know. There's a third one. Go back to Revelation 4.4. 4. They had on their heads what? Crowns of gold. Now, go back to chapter 2, verse 10. In chapter 2, verse 10, to those at the church at Smyrna, he said, the last phrase of verse 10, I'll give thee a crown of life. Look at chapter 3, verse 11. The church of Philadelphia. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy what? Crown. Now we got throne sitters, clothed in white raiment, who have crowns. Could it possibly be there's a clue there? Amen? Is everybody with me? The point I'm making is, the 24 elders, the number 24, represents a completed body of people. I'll give you that. I believe that also. That means whoever they are, they are representative, for elders are representative, and the elders are the representatives in the local church all the way through the New Testament. We appoint elders in every church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are representative of, of a larger body. The completed body have elders representing of them, the 24 indicating that completed body. They are church age believers. It means the church, the completed church, is in heaven while the tribulation is going on on earth. There's not one verse in Revelation that puts the 24 elders on earth. They are always in heaven worshiping the Lord during the tribulation period. I'm one of the 24 elders. I don't know about you. No, we are not going through the tribulation. If you think this is not really heavy-duty proof, wait till next week. And the week following. Revelation 4, verse 5. We've looked so far at the place where the throne of God is located, the person who sat on that throne and the people who sit on thrones around the throne. The fourth thing, just to notice briefly, are the proclamations that come out of the throne. Look at verse 5. Out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices. Boy, that's some throne, isn't it? Look at Revelation 8, verse 5. Revelation 8, verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it upon the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. There it is again. Look at chapter 11, verse 19. The throne of God's really something. What shoots out from it are lightning flashes. Loud thunderings and rumblings and loud voices and coming out of the throne of God. 
Revelation 11:19. the temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. God is giving us dramatic presentations of his mighty power and authority and sovereignty. Chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. This is during the seven last plagues. Verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl unto the, uh, into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is finished. It is done. Do you remember when that was last shouted? When Jesus died on the cross. It is finished. And one day God will say of the judgments upon the world, It is finished. It's done. We're now going to set up the kingdom of God on earth. But look at verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Hey, when God speaks and proclaims something, it's really a marvelous demonstration. Turn to Psalm 18. Psalm chapter 18. There's a lot of evidence in the Bible of God's proclamations from the throne and these thunderings and lightnings and voices. Uh, you have it even in the book of Job, uh, in Job chapter 37. I'll just read it for you. It says, Hear attentively the noise of his voice, the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth unto the whole heaven his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not restrain them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice, and great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. Talk about the greatness of God Almighty. In Psalm 18, look at verse 13. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones, coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and vanquished them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. You know, every now and then someone comes up to me and said, you know, I heard last night the voice of the Lord speaking to me. Now, we might be a little loose with this. I happen to believe the Lord does speak to us. But I think we better be careful about thinking that he has chosen to talk to you in Orange County on planet Earth in 1993. If I were you, I would pray that he speaks softly. Because in Psalm 29 it says that his voice splits rocks and causes earthquakes. Only to hear the voice of the Lord. Obliteration time. We're talking blasting you off the planet if he just says hello. <laughs> you know, we have such a weak and inadequate view of God. Now, I don't want to be uh, overly dramatic. Well, yeah, I do want to be a little bit. But no, seriously, I don't want to over dramatize something, but sometimes we need it. To, to get in our hearts a proper attitude. What do we call the Bible? The Word of God. You know, and some of us treat this message so lightly. Out of that throne comes thunderings and lightnings, and uh, we're talking loud voices and God's dramatic demonstration of his authority and sovereignty, and the way some of us treat this Word. Who do we think we are? This is the word of the living God. Made written for all writing is God breathed so that we can be able to stand the impact of the voice of the Lord God. No wonder the Bible urges us in James to be doers of the word and not auditors only and to bow down literally to the perfect law of liberty, to get on our knees and submit ourselves to the authority of God Almighty. It is his word. And if God had not protected us by putting it in written form, if God had not protected us 
When Jesus came by taking on a corporeal substance, God become man. All of us would be wiped out by the glory of his presence and certainly our eardrums exploding with the power of his voice. And yet some of us think we can do whatever we want to do and we don't need to listen to this book. Can you imagine what John felt after being up there in heaven and seeing this dramatic display of the power and authority and sovereignty of God Almighty? No wonder. No wonder these disciples turned the world upside down. Back to chapter 4, Revelation, verse 5. The fifth thing I'd have you notice is the position of the seven angels. Now, they are in the book of Revelation all the time. They blow the trumpets. They pour out the bowls of wrath. They're ready before God. And God describes them in verse 4 when he says, There are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. We don't need to guess what the lamps are. It says, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God are the seven angels of God. Go back to chapter 1, verse 4. It says that the message to John came from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Very clear. Chapter 2, verse 1, he holds the seven stars in his right hand. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, He that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Look how God gives you the clue as to what it is all the time. In addition to chapter 5, verse 6, we have chapter 8, verse 2, which says, I saw the seven angels who stood before God. Who are the seven spirits who stand before God? Who are the seven lamps of fire before the throne? Who are the? They are the seven angels that are throughout the book of Revelation who stand ready for his angels are ministering spirits sent forth into all the earth by God to execute his plans and it, it represents God's sovereign control once again. Number six. Will you notice the presence of four beasts around the throne in verses six to nine? Four beasts are around the throne. The Greek word is from our word zoology. It's living ones. Sometimes the translations are living creatures. Uh, who are these beasts? Um, interesting, they're mentioned 10 times in Revelation, and they're mentioned 12 times in the first 10 chapters of Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 10, verse 20, it calls them cherubim. These are cherubim angels. Apparently have a, a responsibility and a position higher than the other angels. These four angels are around the throne. They apparently are worship leaders in heaven. Because every time they do something in worship, everybody else follows. They are going to lead us in worship. Now, we had four people up here, and I'm sure they were like angels. But we are going to have around the throne of God four cherubim. Spectacular in appearance. You can read about it in Ezekiel. Amazing. In fact, here in Revelation, we're told that their appearance is like lion, a calf, or an ox a man, and an eagle. Did you catch that in verse 7? What is that all about? Well, that's a quotation from the book of Ezekiel. Now, there are many arguments about what this means. For instance, some people say angels have these characteristics. They uh, act like a lion at times, and like an ox at times, like a man at times, and like an eagle at times. Uh, there's another view that says it pictures Jesus Christ and the four Gospels. I'm just quoting it to you. It's a good man. He loves the Lord, but that's what he saw. Another one says, no, it illustrates the attributes of God. He's like a lion, an ox, a man, an eagle. Now, all these are very interesting, but they don't satisfy the heart of a, a student who wants to know the Word of God. You know what I mean? It's like making things up to kind of connect them together. I believe the Bible indicates a lot more than that. It is a lot clearer than that. I suggest to you that it reminds us of the encampment of Israel around the holy place of God that the four cherubim around the throne of God with this appearance are representing that God's people, God wants around him. And they are the representatives of that. And I'll tell you why. Because if you're Jewish, you already know where I'm going. But if you're not, just listen in. Judah, who's the first in line on one side of the encampment, is of course pictured by the lion. On the other side, the first one is Ephraim, and it's pictured by an ox. Reuben is on the third side, the first in the order, 
and is represented by man. And on the fourth and final one, we have Dan, who is represented by the eagle. How interestingly that the entire encampment of Israel is pictured by the characteristics of the four cherubim that are around the throne of God. Now that makes more sense to me. They each have six wings. That reminds us of Isaiah 6, 1 and 2. When it says in verse 8, they are full of eyes within and they rest not day or night. They say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. I saw the Lord, Isaiah said, in the day that King Uzziah died, a good king, but he made some mistakes. In the last 16 years of his life, he was a leper, and his son Jotham had to reign as a co-regent. And every time people would come in the court, uh, Uzziah had to say, unclean, unclean. And Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The posts of the door shook at the voice of him that cried, and the angels, the seraphim with six wings, uh, they cried, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And he cried out, he said, I'm unclean, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Then one of the angels took off of the tongs of the altar uh, a live coal and placed it on my tongue and said to Isaiah, This hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And Isaiah says, Then said I, uh, Lord, who, who uh, the Lord said to Isaiah, Who? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Now that story is taken and put here in Revelation 4, I think for a very powerful reason. Here these angels, like in Isaiah 6, are proclaiming the holiness of God and the reaction that all of us should have reading it as we examine the throne of God and His holiness, the angels proclaiming His holiness, we should understand once again the problem of our sin and our depravity. We should be like the lepers cry, unclean, unclean. And until God takes a live coal from off the altar, the altar of sacrifice where the animal is killed for atonement, Jesus died in our place. The only thing that can cleanse us, the only thing that can give us access into the presence of God is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, Christians? It's the only way, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through uh, his flesh representing the veil of the temple, we now, through Christ, can go right into the holy presence of God. We do that every day when we get on our knees and pray. Thank the Lord we have direct access. It's a wonderful, wonderful passage. By the way, they say, Lord God Almighty. I just want to quickly refer you to that. Lord God Almighty. That's used five times in the book of Revelation. The words, the Almighty, appears 44 times in the Bible, 31 of them in Job, and only once in the New Testament. Almighty God appears three times, once in Revelation 19, verse 15. But the simple word, Almighty, in Greek, panton, panto, krator, it was used by Romans. The Almighty. All, Pantos, Crator, Mighty, Powerful One. And the Romans had a position like that. It's used ten times, and nine of them are in the book of Revelation. When you look at God's final description of Himself, He is described as the Almighty. There is no one more powerful than God. And Revelation will show that fact beyond a shadow of a doubt. One last thing. Will you notice the praise which the 24 elders give to the one who sits on the throne? Verse 10 and 11. Back it up to verse 9. When the living creatures or beasts give glory. Notice they're the worship leaders. Whenever they do it. Whenever is the word in Greek. It means that any time they do it, evidently they do it frequently. And whenever they do it, everybody else responds. What do the 24 elders do? Remember they represent us in heaven. What are we going to do? The Bible says the four and twenty elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. 
The way they react reminds me of the pride and arrogance that dominates our culture. What do they do? They fall down and worship. I'd like to suggest something that I do in the private place, and I hope you will too. We don't want to do it in front of each other in order to demonstrate our uh, spirituality. Such pride would be an abomination to God. But I'd like to suggest that when you are alone and no one else is around to watch, I'd like to suggest that you fall on your face, lay down with your face toward the ground, your hands outstretched in the presence of God and pray to him. I believe we ought to kneel more than we do. And I don't know if that's uncomfortable for you or not. I'm not making a big legalistic thing here. I'm just saying it's a blessing. No one else is watching. It's just between you and God. Just to lay flat in his presence. And remind yourself that that's what we're going to be doing in the future. The spectacular sight of the presence of Almighty God. And realizing that he sent his son to die for our sins so that we could live forever with him. What else can we do but fall before him? It says they cast their crowns before him. Everything that God rewarded us, all the rewards and for being faithful to him, and every cup of cold water will receive a reward. God will never forget what we've done, and he'll reward us, praise the Lord, when he says, I come quickly, my reward is with me. Be encouraged, faithful pilgrim, I'll reward you. But in that moment, when you see the glory of God, what will you do? You'll take all those crowns and throw them at his feet. You'll realize then what we've only talked about and sung about here, that he alone is worthy. None of the glory belongs to us. Nothing. No good have I. Nothing I bring to him. It's all because of him. Thou art worthy. Thou and thou alone. Not unto us said the psalmist give glory, but unto thy name alone. In that moment, we will understand what we do not understand now both by what he deserves and why he deserves it. Two basic reasons, his power, he created all things, and his pleasure, he can do whatever he wants. I was designed to please God, not myself. I was designed to give him glory, no matter what happens. Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. I'll tell you what some of us need to do because of our arrogance and sin. We need to get right with the Lord right now. We need to confess our sin and repent of it and bow in our hearts before the Lord and thank him for his wonderful grace and faithfulness and mercy for we can be saved because of his son Jesus lowering himself to become a man like you and me to die on a cross and pay the price that we should have paid. What a savior. What a gospel. We'd like to take you to heaven with us. <laughs> Would you like to go? Let's pray. Father, we feel so inadequate trying to express the glory of what we have read in chapter 4. The throne of God and, and, and you upon that throne, Lord, this is beyond our wildest imagination. Lord, I thank you that you're a friend. And I thank you that I can say, Abba, Father, and I'm your child. But Lord, sometimes I have watered down who you really are. Didn't mean to do it, I just did it because I wanted something I could touch or understand. You are the great God who fills the universe with yourself. And to think that you made us in your own image after your likeness, Lord, I don't understand that. But I thank you. And I know, Lord, that we were made to worship you. We were made to bring you pleasure. And we want to please you, Lord. And we do often the opposite. We go our own way and we mess up our lives terribly. We resent, we fight, we're bitter, we're resentful. We do everything we can to oppose your purposes and plans and instead of being still and know that you are God. Father, I pray for those that are not sure of heaven, that you will cause them this evening, before they leave, 
to get that straightened out, that they may know the Savior and know that one day they'll be in the glory of your presence. And I pray that all of us will have a new sense of worship and that our relationship with you will be deeper and more precious than ever before. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.